بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن ولاهم بعد This is our fifth lesson going through the book من هاج الطالبين وعمدة المفتين Both of my Abu Zakaria, Yahya bin Sharaf al-Nawawi, who died in the year 676 after the Hijrah. We stopped at the statement of the author, Faslun. Now, in the kitab we have in front of us, the tahqiq of Darul Minhaj. Uh, underneath each fossil, they mention, essentially, a brief title. Now, this isn't from the author himself, it's put in by the... Uh, the people who made the print. So here they say Faslun fi adabil khala Faslun with regards to the etiquettes pertaining to going to the toilet. Now, this is a subchapter within the chapter Babu Asbab al Hadith. And uh, after the author mentioned the reasons that cause a person to enter into the state of impurity, he focuses his lens on the most common reason. That makes a person enter into the state of ritual impurity And that's of course going to the toilet And either urinating or defecating or doing both And so since that is the case Since that is the most common reason It is useful to dedicate a small subsection within the chapter To discussing the etiquettes pertaining to answering the call of nature And also how to answer the call of nature And also how to purify yourself once you answer the call of nature, which is essentially pertaining to the concept of al istinja. Before he goes into the concept of al istinja, he begins by first mentioning some etiquettes, some behaviors that the person should keep in mind when uh, going to the toilet. The author says, يقدم داخل الخلاء يساره والخارج يمينه. So the first etiquette that the author discusses is pertaining to when you enter into the toilet, which foot do you enter into? Or do you enter into the toilet with? And likewise, when you leave the toilet to come back into the world, what foot do you use to get out first? Do you use the right or the, or the left? And so the sunnah is that when a person enters into the toilet, he enters in with his left foot first and his right foot second. And when he comes out from the toilet, he comes out with his right foot first and his left foot second. يقدم داخل الخلاء يساره والخارج يمينه And this is of course taken from the practice of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that when the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم would enter into the toilet he would enter with his left foot and when he would exit he would exit with his right foot. And of course there is a general principle at play here in that if you're entering into a place which is generally uh, considered qadir, you or considered that which is lesser, you generally start with the left, and when you want to get out of that situation, you go out with the with the right. And the classic example is when entering into the place that has been made to answer the call of nature, or the place that has been dedicated to answering the call of nature. That you enter with your left and you exit with your right. But if you're entering into a place that is mustahsan, that is that is not considered qadir. For example, the masjid, you enter into the masjid with the right foot first, right? And you exit with the left foot first, as the Messenger وسلم, did. And uh, as we know, the famous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, كان يعجبه التيمنة في تناعوله وترجله وطهوله وفي شأنه كله The general principle is that you begin with the right, whether it be in your in the wiping of the or in, in the brushing of the hair you begin with the right side then the left side likewise in the wudu you begin with the right then the left likewise with the wearing of clothes you put on the right side first before the left side when putting on shoes you start with the right and then the left and when you're taking them off you start with the left and then finish with the right yeah and that's of course for the things that are considered good as for the things that are considered qadir right filth and so on or something which is lesser being relatively speaking to that which is being compared to right um, you start with the left and you uh, end with the right when going in and then going out you start with the right and you end with the left as is the case with the with the toilet the 
The author then says, وَلَا يَحْمِلُ ذِكْرَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And he shouldn't carry with him that which has been written on it, ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ مثلا, Quran or uh, Adhkar He shouldn't enter into the toilet with that And the reason for that is the fact that the toilet um, is a place which is generally filthy And there are impurities in the toilet, generally speaking Especially back in the days as well When, yeah, the the cleanliness was not of the same standard as it is as it is today and the hygiene wasn't as uh, it's not of the same standard as it is today and also because of the fact that the messenger sallallahu is reported from him that من حديث أنس that uh, when he would enter into the toilet كان ينزع خاتمه he used to um, remove his khatam the khatam that had on it محمد رسول الله of course there's اختلاف كبير based on the authenticity of that report however uh, the ulama generally according to especially the shafi'iyya and here especially um, the basis for this masala wala yahmilu dhikr allah ta'ala is the hadith and generally wala yahmil the nahi here is the tahrim the nahi here is the tahrim now of course there are maybe uh, special dispensations or exemptions for example someone who fears that the mushaf he leaves it outside that uh, uh, someone's going to take it or someone's going to do damage to it in that case uh, we apply the qaida of al-darurat to be al and so you can take the mushaf into the toilet with you because there's a maslaha in doing so but the basis or the general qaida is wala yahmilu dhikr allah ta'ala and of course when we say dhikr allah we invite al-maktubah not al mahfuza someone might have memorized the quran he might have memorized many adhkar do we say that this person because he carries with him the adhkar hifzan that you can't enter into the toilet لا. طيب rather what's been spoken about here is وَلَا يَحْمِرُ ذِكْرَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الْمَكْتُوبَةِ الْمَكْتُوبَةِ لَا لَلْمَحْفُوظَةِ طيب والله عالم The author then says وَيَعْتَمِدُ جَالِسًا يَسَارَهُ Now especially back in those days and even in some parts of the world today when you go to the toilet you find that the toilet isn't like how it is today where you have a modern seat rather the toilet was basically a hole in the ground and so you would have to squat squat right down and then answer the call of nature so when you squat and you enter into that squatting position do you try to squat straight or do you lean to one of your sides now it's easier to lean now which side should I lean on the author mentioned you should lean upon your left side and not the right side and the reason for this, or well, there are two reasons for this. The first reason is um, a weak hadith that has come. The hadith of Suraqah ibn Malik al Mudliji, right? Um, where he said the Messenger وسلم, told us to, when we enter into the toilet, however, the hadith is weak. And the second reason is because of the, uh, what they say, um, uh, uh, reasons that are health based. In that it makes it easier for the um, the feces to to come out and for the excrement to come out, and that it makes it easier for a person to fulfill the action. And so, because of those two reasons, they mention that this is a adab, this is an etiquette. So when you sit in that squatted position, that you rely upon the left side. Now, of course, if you can't rely on the left side, some people aren't left-sided; they're right-sided. And so they have to rely on their right. right? Even if you don't want to rely upon any side, just stand up, just squat straight. But the adab here, based upon what the author mentioned here, um, and of course he himself when he discussed this, he mentioned that the hadith is weak. But we rely upon it. We spoke about his madhab in fadail al-amal when we took the introduction to the riyadh al-sariheen. And so when he says يساره, that when a person enters into the toilet and is answering the call of nature and is in a squatted position, that he relies on the left side. And again, this can even apply upon when done on our modern toilets that we sit on. Even though science, scientific studies show that it is better to squat than to sit in the position that makes us, or in the position that we do when we, when we sit on the modern toilets. And there are health benefits to squatting compared to sitting in that position. But even if you sit in that position, Right, you can 
um, uh, مثلا what they do as a compromise you get a, a stool and you put it underneath the toilet and you put your legs on the stool and that gives you the health benefits of as though you're squatting which is common which is becoming more common in today's society because you can't get rid of these uh, modern toilets they just dominate everywhere especially here in the west and so they came up with this compromise of this stool underneath the underneath the toilet that a person can rest his feet on so that he can gain the benefits of squatting and and not have to go through the uh, or not have to suffer from the consequences of sitting on the toilet in the way that uh, the modern toilets make us sit but even when you're on the modern toilets you can also rest on your left side and you can still perform this masala of and of course another masala another benefit with regards to choosing the left over the right is the fact that the left in these kinds of actions is what we should do like we mentioned with regards to the entering into the toilet because this is a fear which is mustaqla right this is a fear which is what makruh mustaqla not makruh hukman as a hukum shari but in terms of it's a dislike act it's an act which people want to keep private and it's not something that you know it's something praiseworthy <laughs> uh, it's a natural action no doubt about it but it's not, it's not something to be proud of and so since that is the case they say that we can apply that qa'i that we mentioned previously here as well that you choose the left over the over the right طيب والله أعلم The author then says ولا يستقبل القبلة ولا يستدبرها في الصحراء ويحرمان بالصحراء So here now the author mentions another etiquette which is pertaining to facing the Qibla when answering the call of nature or turning or back to the Qibla when answering the call of nature and that the answer is that this is not allowed لما ثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من حديث يبيوب الأنصار رضي الله عنه when he said that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said So that hadith, the nahi here is لِلْتَحْرِيمِ However, you have another hadith, hadith ibn Umar I climbed onto the roof on the house of Hafsa I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answering the call of nature يَسْتَقْبِلُ الشَّامَ وَيَسْتَدْبِرُ and so how do you reconcile between these two hadith? The Aimah, they mention that the Nahi that is taken in the hadith of Ayyub al-Ansari is applied to Sahra, which is why I know he mentions When you are in the open space, it becomes haram for you to face the Qibla or turn your back to the Qibla. But if you are in a place, the place that has been dedicated or made to answer the call of nature, then in this scenario, it is not haram for a person to face the Qibla or turn his back to the Qibla, so there's the there's separation between the two maqams, the maqam of al-Sahra and the maqam of al-Makan al-Mu'ad liqadha al haja If you are in a place in which it has been dedicated or it has been made for you to answer the call of nature in, right, this is not in your control. You don't have control because it wasn't made by you. It was yani, part of parcel of the house that it came with, right? So this is a makam that has been dedicated. It's known this is where you answer the call of nature. But as a Sahra, uh, it's an open space, right? It has not been dedicated to answering the call of nature. And so everywhere in the Sahara can be a place where you can face the Qibla. Whereas in the Makan al qada al Haja, this place has been dedicated to answering the call of nature. So it's not a place where you're going to pray anyway. Right? So that's why the Rukhsa has been given. And we see that in the Hadith of Ibn Umar. And of course, also, yeah, another Hadith in which the Messenger of Allah, one day before his death, he was seen what? Urinating whilst facing the Qibla. طيب. And so the al Makan al Mu'adli qada al Haja, in this case, you are allowed to face the Qibla and uh, turn your back to the Qibla if of course yani, you should try to avoid it as much as you can anyway and generally speaking many of the or most of the toilets especially in the Muslim lands they don't face the Qibla or turn your back to or make your back turn towards the Qibla anyway and so they, they avoid it um, they, uh, they avoid it they avoid um, making toilets that face the Qibla or make your back turn towards the Qibla however maybe in Kufar lands they may not give any care to that and so in these cases this hukum of al jawaz comes into play as for if you are in an open space, then it's haram for you to face the Qibla or turn your back to the Qibla because you have the option of facing a direction that is different because you are in an open space, it's an open field, you are surrounded by essentially the, the earth. And so, in this case, we apply So the author says, the author then says, That when a person wants to answer the call of nature, especially if they are in an open space and with others, 
that they would step away from the people and go far away from them as possible. And there are a number of benefits. Number one, you protect yourself from their uh, gaze. Likewise, you protect your feces and your urine, which may uh, um, have a dodgy smell to it or whatever from the people. And the Messenger وسلم, he did so either the Habal Madhaba Avada. When the Messenger وسلم, would go to answer the call he would make sure that he would do it as far away from the people as, as possible. So وَيَبْعُدُ So you should not be with the people answering the call of nature, especially if you are in an open space. Rather, you should go as far away from them as possible so that you protect your harm from them. وَالْمُسْلِمُ مَنْ سَلِمَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ مِنْ لِسَانِهِ وَيَدِيهِ طَيِّمْ أَيِّ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ وَيَسْتَتِرْ Likewise, when you answer in the call of nature and you're with people, you should what? Hide yourself. You should not be seen when answering the call of nature. You should hide your private parts, hide your uh, self. So, method and today what we see, people answering the call of nature in urinals where, you know, you can see everything. And if you were to just take a peek, you could see everything, right? Um, this is not from the etiquette of the Muslim, right? Rather, when the Muslim goes to the toilet, he should be what? Making himself private, making himself secluded, seclude himself and hide yourself. The Messenger of Allah, when he go to the toilet in an open space, he will try to look for a wall or look for a, 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 a thick tree so that he can hide behind and answer the call of nature to the وَيَبْعُدُ وَيَسْتَتِرُ <coughs> The author then says وَلَا يَبُولُ فِي مَاءٍ رَاكِدُ That the person should not urinate in stagnant water especially if the water is um, small, small volume because you're going to ruin it for others someone might want to see the stagnant water and take from it so they can drink it or you can use it for <coughs> other purposes but you come and uh, you urinate in it and we mentioned in the chapters previously that uh, in al al rakid the stagnant water if it's below two qullas and your najasa touches it خلاص, it becomes najis and since it's not mad that flows it, it won't it won't renew and won't be able to get rid of that just because it's stagnant and so you've ruined the water for the people of Sitta Adihim and of course the Messenger Sallallahu he mentioned the famous hadith لا يبول أن أحدكم في الماء الدائم الذي لا يجري ثم يقتصر منه and Allah goes لا يبول أن أحدكم في الماء الراكد في رواية مسلم now then he says وجحرين likewise you shouldn't um, urinate in a hole that belongs to whether it be an animal or and even the jinn as mentioned by Qatara and this is based on the hadith of Abdullah ibn Sarjis in which the Messenger وسلم, forbade urinating into these natural holes, those holes made in the ground outside. Um, and uh, Qatara was asked, What's the illa for this? He said, uh, It is the homes of the jinn. And likewise, if you have the hole that belongs to those animals that make holes in the ground, you shouldn't urinate in them. He then says, Likewise, you shouldn't urinate in the direction um, of the wind. So if there's wind blowing in a direction, you shouldn't urinate in that direction. And why is that? Because you want to prevent the urine from dispersing on you. Because if you urinate in that region where the wind is coming, the, the urine will fall back on you. And as we know, the Messenger of Allah Sultan commanded us to, and, and, and that we avoid the urine, as we know, the two individuals. Uh, who are who the Messenger of Allah went by their grave and they were being punished by Yuadabani fi Kabir, Fakan Ahaduma la yesteti rumin al bowl. That one of them never used to protect himself from the from the urine, meaning he would just urinate and it didn't matter whether it got on his clothes or it hit back on him. He did not give any care to that. And so you should not urinate in, in, in this re in this place uh where you can't protect yourself from, from the urine. Likewise, mutahaddath, meaning in the places where people gather together to converse and talk. So, مثلا, in, in our modern uh, case, you'll be looking at مثلا, cafes. So, مثلا, if the people are sitting in a cafe or sitting in a, in, a, in a gathering and they're talking, you shouldn't urinate in that gathering because you get to see the him. You're going to ruin their place for them where they gather together to speak and converse. وطريقين, likewise, you shouldn't urinate on a road, on a public road, or defecate in the public road. You shouldn't do that. Why? Because again, tufsidu ala nas, you're going to ruin the people who walk, or you're going to make it harder for people to walk on that public road. Either they're going to smell that stench, right, or they might step on it, right, and that makes their clothes or their their foot nejis. And so you're making things harder for the rest of the mankind or the rest of the people who use that public road. And the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also prohibited that we uh, urinate on 
او عندي طريق اذني سوى تحتها مثمره meaning underneath a tree that um, bears fruit and the reason for that is the the the, the, tree, the tree that bears fruit the fruit might fall down and if you urinate on the bottom of that tree and the fruit falls down the fruit is good the fruit will become najis right because it comes into contact with the najasa perhaps and uh, also you're going to this you're going to um, cause problems for the people as well the people are going to see you urinate underneath that tree and they're not going to want to touch that tree or the fruits that bear from that tree because they they have that you know bad bad thought of you know, any well this put these people urinate under this tree um, and so maybe the fruit might have problems with it or the fruit might uh, not be uh, pure enough but even so people will avoid that tree but even so now you've ruined for the people the opportunity of benefiting from uh, a fruit bearing tree and so you shouldn't do that either and the messenger of Allah also forbade that as well so here the author mentions certain places in which you shouldn't urinate la fi ma'i rakid wa la fi juhrin wa la fi mahabbi rihin wa la mutahadatin wa tariqin wa tahta shajarat muthmira and these are just examples the ilal that they share or the ilal that we mentioned if it applies to something else that wasn't mentioned likewise the hukum will take that as well qiyasan Right, so مثلا, uh, if the illa that we mentioned مثلا, for mahabiriyah, the illa is what? That we don't want the urine to disperse on us. We want to protect ourselves and our bodies from the urine that we release. Now, if you now urinate in some place like مثلا, a wall, in which you know that if you, urinate, if you urinate on that wall, the urine will come back on you, or the urine will, you will not be able to protect yourself from that wall, from that, from that urine, uh, you can't urinate in that place either. Qiyas and ala, mahab. Because the illah is the, is the same. Uh, one further point to add with regards to the last two points. The famous hadith of the Prophet Right? Uh, Fear those two places in which you can potentially, or you are more likely for you to be cursed. And that is uh, those who defecate and urinate in the public road or on the public road. And those who defecate and urinate in the, in the places where the people take shade. So an example of a of a place where people take shade is underneath a fruit bearing tree. That they want to take rest under and shade under to protect themselves from the sun and the heat of the sun. In this case, if they see that you're urinating in that in, the, in that place and defecating in that place, they might curse you because you've now stopped them from taking that place as a place of shade. Likewise, if you, you urinate and defecate on a public road and a person steps into it or a person becomes harmed by it, he's gonna be more likely to curse you for that. And since you've oppressed him, you have oppressed them, the da'wat al and the oppression of the mother is something which is a grave sin and that uh, you are highly unlikely that this curse might be accepted from Allah of course the la'na itself, la'na itself is what min rahmatillah the person who curses you is essentially asking Allah to remove his mercy from you and so if you now urinate on the public road or urinate in the shade and you oppress the person who stepped on your um, on your feces as a result or could not protect themselves from the sun as a result of your actions and then they made dua against you or they cursed you they are mudroom and we know the messenger of Allah he said it taqwa da'wat al mudroom fear the uh, the da'wah of the oppressed person why فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ there is no hijab between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should avoid that as well the author then says وَلَا يَتَكَلَّمْ that he, the person who is answering the call of nature shouldn't be speaking unless there is a necessity, unless there is a need to do so. So people, they would in those days gather together and answer the call of nature together and have conversations. Rather what's uh, needed is that a person when he's answering the call of nature focus on that action and don't speak unless there is a necessity or a need to do so. Of course if there is a hajj or there is a need to talk then you fulfill that need to talk and khalas and then you keep quiet once that need is fulfilled. But anything outside of that you shouldn't engage in speaking when answering the call of nature. The author then says وَلَا يَسْتَنْجِي بِمَاءٍ فِي مَجْلِسِهِ That the person shouldn't use water to clean themselves while seated in the same position that they were when performing the uh, act of urination or defecation. Now let's say you have a person who is squatting on a flat surface and he then urinates and defecates. Of course that urine and feces will be on the flat surface. If he starts washing water or pouring water onto his uh, region to cleanse it, that water is going to fall upon the najasa. 
and if it falls upon the najasa it might ricochet off the najasa and fall upon you or come back to your body right so that rashashat al ma the water that ricochets off the najasa during your pouring of that water when in washing that private part process washing your private parts that water might ricochet off the najasa back onto you that's if you are still seated in the same position in which you perform the act of uh, answering the call and nature and so that's why it's better that you get out of that position and move away from the najasa and then use water to cleanse yourself with طيب, in order to avoid that potential ricocheting of najasa back onto you طيب. and uh, my father used to give this advice because it, it whilst it whilst it mainly you know, it, it becomes clear and apparent when you're urinating or defecating on a flat surface but it also applies on the modern toilets as well because the distance between where you sit it where your buttocks lies and the place where the urine and feces drops isn't that long and so when you put water and you start pouring water onto the region and start cleansing that and start and begin to cleanse yourself the water will fall into that little hole in the bowl at the bottom of the modern toilet but it might ricochet back up right and it, and it sometimes does right especially if you do it hard right and especially if you use in our case we don't have the sprayer things in this country we have to use a actually the water bottle or something like that so when you pour that water in all right um it might ricochet and so my father used to give us the advice of just jump into the shower right and cleanse yourself in that way and that should be sufficient for you or wash yourself using the method that we usually do and then go into the shower afterwards um and of course we also use the tissue first and then go into the shower as well so those three methods are what you can apply but the basis here is what well i stand you not in the majority that you shouldn't use water to perform stinger in the same position that you perform the act of answering the call of nature in and the reason for that is as we highlighted to protect yourself from rashashat al bawd or rashashat al alma i should say the ricocheting of the water the droplets of water ricocheting from the najasa after you poured water uh, upon your region to clean it right you don't want that water to ricochet off the najasa which it falls upon once you wash yourself with you don't want it to fall back onto your body so to avoid that you get up you move from that najasa and then you wash yourself and that should be sufficient wallahu alam and of course uh, if there is no fear for that meaning if there is this fear is not present meaning that you method let's say you you defecate into a hole which is far away from your uh, from your buttocks from the place in which you are seated or or squatting if that's the case and there is no contact between the man and the najasa then you can of course continue performing the najasa uh, the istinja with ma in your majlis the author then says wa yastabiru min al bawl when you urinate you have to take great care that all the urine passes out of the body and that's wajib you have to make sure that all the urine has passed out and that there is no urine left in the in the uh, in the region that it generally comes out from and one of the best ways to ensure that uh, you've performed the istibra is to take some paper and to uh, run your fingers upon your sexual organ once and have the paper right on the tip and see if there's any wetness that attaches onto the paper and continue doing that it should once twice thrice and on the third time generally speaking you'll find that the paper once you run your um your your two fingers on your sexual organ you'll find that the paper becomes dry and there is no wetness on the paper and once you've done that khalas you now pretty certain you have done raja right that uh, you have performed this tibra and that khalas you now finished the urine completely طيب. because some people what they do is they urinate and as soon as they see the urine stopping khalas they start watching themselves لا. because yani take a, an example let's say you pour water upon something from a bucket when you pour the water completely in one go so you want to yani flip the bucket of water in one go Once you do it, there's always going to be remnants left. Once you finish, once the main body of the water has fallen out from the bucket, there are always or a few drops and and so left. So you've got to make sure that these drops have also been removed from your from your organ. 
And how do you do that? How best to do that without falling into a sweat? Is this method that I mentioned? Take some paper, put it right on the tip of the of the uh, of the penis. Yeah, we're talking to men here, so on the sexual organ, and for women also the similar method can apply as well. And uh, run your fingers on that on that organ. Once you'll find that the paper will have some wetness on it, and then to maybe take another section of the of the paper or take a new paper if you want, and do it again. Take a new paper and do it again, and generally by the third one, for about a third time you'll find, or the fourth time you'll find that the paper becomes dry. And once it becomes dry, you have that one rajah that indeed uh, I have performed this tibra min al bowl. And we know the messenger of Allah he mentioned amatu amatu al qabr min al bowl that the main or the the majority of uh, cases of punishment in the grave are from the from the bowl. So it's important that we give great care to uh, to to how we urinate and uh, that we urinate completely. And we ensure that our, ur our urination is complete before we then begin the process of istinja, right? The Messenger of Allah, as we mentioned earlier, the Hadith, that مر على قبرين ما يعذبان في كبير أما أحدهما فكان لا يستتر البول في رواية كان لا يستبرئ من البول. طيب والله أعلم. The author says ويقول عند دخوله بسم الله اللهم من يعوذ بك من الخبوث والخبائث and of course you can recite it with the sukoon as well من الخبث والخبائث وعند الخروجه أيضا غفرانك الحمد لله الذي أذهب عني الأذى وعافاني and so when you enter into the toilet it is recommended that you say oh Allah in the name of Allah بسم الله oh Allah إني أعوذ بك I seek refuge in you uh, من الخبث والخبائث against the male and female uh, شياطين or the male and female evil spirits من الخبوث والخبائث and you can also refer يعني جمع خبيثة الخبائث جمع خبيثة and خبوث جمع خبيث and it's referring to the male شياطين الذكور وإناثهم نعم and you can also refer to filth as well i.e. the actual impurities as well طيب وعند and of course this is authentic authentically established on the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم كان من حديث أنس كان إذا دخل الخلاء قال الله من يعوذ بك من الخبوث والخبائث أما عند الخروج when you exit the toilet, here the author mentioned that you should say, Wufranaka, O oh Allah, I seek refuge, uh, I seek your forgiveness. O oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness, I beseech your forgiveness. Alhamdulillahi alladhi adhab anni al-adha wa'afani. Indeed, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has kept, kept evil, i.e. whether it be the impurity or the male jinn or the male evil spirits and the female evil spirits. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved me from that and the hadith that has come that the messenger وسلم, said this is, is weak and we mentioned that uh, the manhaj of an we generally speaking in his kutub is that when it comes to fadail al-amal yurakhisu fiha he is lax when it comes to the ahadith pertaining to fadail al-amal and this is from fadail al-amal so generally speaking, when you enter into the toilet, it's recommended that you make this dua, Allahumma inni, a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith, and mention the name of Allah. And as you come out, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gufranaka, alhamdulillahi, alladhi adhaba anni al-adha wa'afani. And with that, the author ended the masail pertaining to adabu qadha al-hajah. And he now moves on to the second part of this section, in which we discuss the methodology of uh, cleansing oneself and purifying oneself after answering the call of nature. He says, It is obligatory that you perform the act of istinja. And istinja is what? It is the act of purifying oneself after answering the call of nature. Now the tool that you use to fulfill an istinja must either be water or stone. It must either be water or stone. And then he says, وَجَمْعُهُمَا أَفْضَلُ And to combine between water and stone is better. وَجَمْعُهُمَا أَفْضَلُ So the, essentially the tools that you can use to purify yourself after answering the call of nature can be of how many different levels? We can say three levels. The first level is to combine between water and stone. That's the highest level. That's the best. And then you have the second level, which is you only use water or stone. And here... In this second level, we say water is better than stone, meaning sufficing yourself with just water is better than sufficing yourself with just stone. And then the final and third level will be to suffice yourself with stone. So you have using them together, 
using water by itself and then the lowest level using stones by itself and then he says and then he now says that when we say the word al-hajar anything that meets the following points also takes the position of a hajar so in method in today's society nobody ever goes to a modern toilet and has stones with him and starts using stones to what to wipe himself or to uh, perform his jet with la rather what we use is paper now paper meets the conditions we meant we're going to mention inshallah and so paper takes the position of a of a hajar مثلا, so these four points it must be what jamid meaning hard solid it can't be liquid طاهر, must be clean i.e pure can't be what najis najis will be najis you can't use impurity to uplift or to remove an impurity qali'in meaning able to remove filth qali' able to remove filth and ghayru muhtaram meaning it can be thrown away it's not respected طيب, so these four points are needed and the paper that we use today the tissue paper that is used today meets all these conditions it is jamid it's solid it's hard likewise it's what tahir it is clean it's pure right Qala, it's able to remove the filth, right? It can extract the filth from the mother and najasa. And it can be thrown away. It's ghayr muhtaram. The Andrex or the tissues that we use today, other companies are available. طيب, so, if these, uh, if the, uh, if these four conditions are met, then that material that meets these four conditions is also considered a hajar. So when we say uh, uh, is just one uh, one example. But anything that meets the dhadat, the canon, which is if these four conditions are met, then whatever material that meets these four conditions is also considered and can also take the position of a of a hajar. طيب. Now if you look at the Rafi's Muharrar, he missed out one of these conditions. He missed out one of these conditions, right? Uh, when he said of Iman al Hajar, he said of Iman al Hajar, So he forgot to add the Jamid. And the reason why is because, uh, and the reason why you have to add Jamid is because you might have liquid materials uh, that are also But you can't use these liquid materials to perform Istinja uh, with. You can only use water. You can't use مثلا rose Of course when we say water invited ma on tahur When we say of course ma invited ma tahur Not ma tahir or ma najis Ma tahur نعم أي الطاهر في نفس المطهر لي لغير We spoke about that in previous lesson طيب And so you can't use مثلا vinegar Vinegar is قالع It's طاهر It's غير محترم But it's not jamid So jamid is a necessary condition To remove these points And of course this is an, uh, an application Of what I know we mentioned in the in the introduction, remember when he said that I'm going to uh, So this is an example of that being clarified here The author then says Meaning that So the wow is Right uh, that if you have a hide that has gone through a tanning process then it can also take the meaning of a hajar and of course the type of hide that can be tanned you can have the hide of an animal that had been slaughtered correctly or the hide of a, the hide of a dead animal that is a meter in the case of a meter of course this hide is nejis right and so you can't use it either way whether it's madbugh or ghair madbugh you can't use it since the hide is nejis and you can't use something that is nejis to purify uh, or to remove an impurity so, but as for the kharuf for the sheep method and that we slaughter correctly uh, and a valid islamic slaughtering its uh, hide is something which is uh, pure however the problem with uh, this uh, this type of hide is that it still has moisture and so it may lack when it comes to the conditions of al-jumud of being solid and clean and hard and also it's now what it won't be able to remove and uh, make the filth uh, be removed from mawdi and najaza or yani mawdi al khuruj so since that is the case there's ikhtilaf as to whether we can use 
this jild غير المدبوخ which is why the author mentioned وجلد دبغ دون غيره في الأظهر so according to the Azhar view which is one of the, 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 the preponderant view in al-Shafi'i himself from al-Shafi'i himself rahimahullah the preponderant view is that we only consider al-jild al-madbuq the hide that has been tanned because once you tan the, that hide خلاص, it, it meets those conditions it meets the conditions of what? of al-jamid, qali', tahir, ghayr muhtaram right? Whether, whether we had the first Example of the hide of a kharuf that had been Islamically slaughtered or the kharuf that died naturally and it became a mater. In both cases, once you make it undergo the process of tanning, it meets these conditions. It loses the moisture, so it's becoming now jamid and qali'. And in the case of the dead animal, so the yield of the mater that was ghayr madbuq, once it becomes hina dubiga, forced through the process of istihara, it becomes tahir. Ta'ib. And so that's why he said, وَجِلْدٍ دُبِغَ دُونَ غَيْرِهِ فِي الْأَظْهَرِ Meaning it's permissible. For you to use بمعنى الحجر Meaning it can be used As an element Or as a material For its ninja purposes If it is a tanned hide A tanned hide of an animal But if it's an untanned hide of an animal Even if it is tahir You can't use it في الأظهر And the reason for that Is because it lacks When it comes to the condition of uh, Being jamidan And قالع طيب And that's in brief والله أعلم Remember we mentioned that These three levels Use water and stones together, use water by itself, and use stones by itself. So when it, when am I allowed to use stones by itself? When is it allowed for me to use stones or ma fi ma'na al-hajar? He says, وَشَرْطُ الْحَجَرِ أَلَّا يَجِفَّ النَّجَسِ That the first condition with regards to the permissibility of using hajar by itself is that the najas must not become dry. The najas must not dry out. If it dries out, then you're going to be using something which is already dry and something which is solid and something which is tahir and qaliya, meaning it's able to remove the uh, filth away from the mawdha al khuruj. But if it's dried up, how are you going to use something dry to get rid of something dry? That, that's not going to work. But yeah, so, la yajif al najas. The najas must not dry up. Number two, wa la yantaqil. The urine or feces must not go beyond the regions from which they have exited. Because if they do go beyond these regions, then it becomes compulsory to use water. وَلَا يَنْتَقِلَ مَثَلًا You urinate. And urine now runs down the leg. Or you um, or you uh, have, مثلًا, defecation. And when you defecate, some of the feces go somewhere else. On your, مثلًا, the outer part of the butter region. Or method and it goes down the legs again. Method if it's um, a wet form of feces, diarrhea, for example, and it runs down the leg. Or method and some of the urine touches the thigh, meaning it goes beyond the, uh, يعني, uh, it, goes, it goes beyond the normal region from which they have exited. Meaning the hashafa for the, uh, the the male sexual organ, the tip of the penis, and the uh, inner butthole, the inner buttocks of the uh, for the feces on the backside. طيب. So that's the second condition. The third condition is ولا يطرأ عليه أجنبي. Something external must not come upon this نجاسة. مثلا uh, water, other water, uh, مثلا water, or مثلا uh, another نجاسة, or مثلا something external, something which is what أجنبي, something which is foreign, a foreign substance, be it a substance that is طاهر or نجس. If it comes upon this نجاسة. Then of course this najasa has now increased in volume. There's a there's a new uh, because remember the najasa that was on your body when you when you were one, when you wanted to use the hajar, if something falls upon it, then that thing will also become najasa, and so you have the initial najasa plus something new which became najasa as well. And so since that is the case, you have now more najasa than you had before that thing fell on it or before that ajnabi that foreign substance came upon it. And so since that is the case, the hajar no longer becomes sufficient for you to use in. Uh, impurification alone you have to use water with it طيب. or just use water طيب. so al-hajar can be used in when these three general conditions are met the author says meaning if what comes out is something which is rare i.e. blood meaning not urine or feces or in فوق العادة. Remember, when you urinate normally or defecate normally, 
not all of the anal orifice is touched by the najasa, and not all of the tip of the penis is touched by the urine. That's in a natural and normal case. But sometimes you might urinate more than normal, or you might defecate more than normal, such that the defecation or the, yani the remnants of defecation, the traces of feces and the traces of urine attach onto uh, other parts of the penis, uh, other parts of the tip of the penis and other parts of the anal orifice. So method and you might have diarrhea so much so that the uh, feces uh, spreads across the anal orifice as you can see here. So method and here you have the anal orifice like that, that circular part and so when you release normally naturally only a small part of the anal orifice is uh, soiled by that uh, or has traces of feces left but these traces can sometimes expand and spread if you release an extraordinary quantity of, of feces but you and it might spread across the anal orifice now as long as it doesn't go beyond the anal orifice but you the author said and likewise you might urinate a lot uh, however, the urine does not go beyond the tip of the penis. According to the other view, you are allowed to restrict yourself to just using um, stones and you don't have to use water. Remember, we said if it does, however, do intiqal, meaning it goes beyond the anal orifice or beyond the tip of the penis. For example, let's say the urine touches the, uh, the bit, this part of the penis, or methane touches the thighs or the, the nut sack or the backside. For example, the the feces gets to the uh, uh, gets to the uh, outer buttock region and goes beyond the anal orifice, goes beyond the inner butthole. Then, in this case, we mentioned مسألة الانتقال انتقال so لا يجزي الحجر. But in the case of it not going beyond the صفحة or the حشفة وانتشر فوق العادة جاز الحجر في الأظهر. According to the other view from the Shafi'i, it is permissible for you to just rely, or it is sufficient for you to just rely upon الحجر. And to not add water, to not use water, and of course it applies as well on whether on a dara as well. As for the second view, which is the uh, less preponderant view from the Shafi'i, then whether it is nadir or the intishar, um, in i intishar of al qadah, meaning it goes beyond what is normal, and uh, even if it doesn't go beyond the hasafa or the hashafa, there is still intiqal here, and so they say that we apply the general principle la la yudzi al hajar. The hajar is not sufficient; you have to use water as well. However, yeah, this is in, in, in what the author mentioned. But this is the other view. Uh, and and, and uh, anything beyond that, of course, when we said if there is intiqal outside of the hashafa or the safha, you have to come with the water or combine the water and the, and the stone. As for that which is nadir, then, for example, if you urinate blood or something, or if you defecate blood or something, then you can use hajar according to the Alhar view. Wallahu alam. The author then says, Wasunna li itar, meaning when it comes to the istijmar, it is best to do it in an odd number. Man istijmara fa liyutir, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. So, methalan, if someone wipes once, and then twice, and then three times, and he found that he hasn't yet come within qa, so he continues. And then on the fourth wiping, he found that he has come with an inqa. He's come with four wipings. Four is an even number. It is sunnah to add an extra wiping to make it five. And that comes with what? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu That the number of wipings you do, make sure that it's what? Odd. And when we say odd, meaning more than one. So multiple odd number. So method, if someone required three masahat to reach an inqa, and he did it once, twice, three times, and then here, he's come with the wajib, يجب ثلاث مساحات, of course, and he's also come with al-ithar. He's also come with al-ithar. What if someone wiped himself twice, and he came with inqa, he has to come with the third one, because he has to come with the obligation, ثلاث مساحات نهانا رسول الله ألا نسنجي بحجر بأقل من ثلاثة أحجار كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. And so he has to come with the third one, which is obligatory. Once he comes to that third obligatory one, uh, that will be, again, an odd number. He's come with the wider, come with an odd number of wipings, and he's come with the wajib as well. If someone requires 12 wipings to reach an inqa, then those 12 wipings is an even number, add one extra to make it odd. That's essentially what's meant by wasunna al itar based on the hadith of the Prophet. The author then says, 
يوزعنا بجانبي والوسط. So when it comes to the wiping of the anus, every stone that I use to wipe, do I make sure that I wipe the entire region for each wiping, or do I divide the region into two sections, the two sides and the middle? So I wipe one side, I wipe the second side, and then I wipe the middle. And each wiping is considered a mess. So here he says, وَكُلُّ حَجَرٍ لِكُلِّ مَحَلِّهِ وَقِيلَ يُوَزَّعْنَ لِجَانِبَيْهِ وَالْوَسَطِ So there's khilaf here. And the first khilaf is revolving around this word. What is it ma'atufa upon? Is it ma'atufa on وَيَجِبُ ثَلَاثُ مَسَحَاتِ Or is it وَيَجِبُ سَنُّ الْإِتَارِ If it's obligatory, if it's ma'atufa upon وَيَجِبُ ثَلَاثُ مَسَحَاتِ Meaning it's also obligatory to use each stone for every single or for all of the region or for the entire region. Meaning when you wipe using a stone, you wipe the entire region from the the one side to the next including the middle that's one wiping and then a second wiping and then a third wiping which encompasses the entire orifice region that's one view the second view says لا, بل هذه سنة. this is a sunnah because it's معطوفن upon وسنة الإيتار وسنة الإيتار and so since that is the case أيضا ويسنو كل حجر لكل محله meaning it's sunnah for you to use each wiping uh, or to use each stone for the entire region. So when you wipe using each stone, each wiping encompasses the entire region. And then he says, وقيلة. And we should know what وقيلة is when we use the term قيلة. قالة. And no, we should know that already from the introduction when the author says وقيلة. Right? What did the author say? When he says وحيث أقول وقيلة كذا فهو وجه ضعيف والصحيح أو إلى صح خلافه So وقيلة is referring to the أصحاب so it's a wajah that is da'if amongst the, amongst the ashab. Naam, qila, yuwazza'na li janibayhi wa al That you separate each wiping, one wiping for the right side, one wiping for the left side, one wiping through the middle. And that gives you the three wipings, da'if, uh, that are obligatory. And of course, if those three wipings aren't sufficient, you start again, right? And uh, uh, until inqa' is achieved, until inqa' is, is achieved, da'if. So that's the, the two uh, opinions on the mas'ala wal asah that which is more correct is what kullu hajar li kulli mahalli that for each wiping you make sure that the entire region is wiped so for wiping one you wipe the region wiping two you wipe the entire region wipe three you wipe the entire region you don't just suffice yourself with just one side for one wiping the other side for another wiping and the middle for another wiping that's a weak view amongst some of the ashab طيب الله alam the author then says, وَيُسَنُّ لِسْتِنْجَاءُ بِيُسَارِهِ It's also a sunnah to use the left hand for the purposes of a istinja. And of course that's uh, understood with regards to uh, using water. So what you do is you take the right hand, uh, you take the cup of water, the bottle of water, or the material that the water is in with your right hand and you pour it with the right hand and you deal with the uh, washing of the region with the left hand. But what about in the case of a istijmar? Because when he says, وَيُسَنُّ بِيَسَارِهِ Remember the طَبْعَ that I have in front of the طَبْعَ دَارَ الْمِنْهَاجِ It doesn't have the word al But as the طَبْعَ that we have online mentions what? وَيُسَنُّ أَلِسْتِنْجَاءُ بِيَسَارِهِ So if the طَبْعَ online restricts it to al-istinja' When it comes to al-istijmar And the author here when he says, وَيُسَنُّ بِيَسَارِهِ It encompasses both istinja' and istijmar But in the case of istijmar, remember we are prohibited from touching our penis with our right hand as well that you shouldn't touch the penis with the right hand. And so now here you have a conundrum. You can't touch the penis with the right hand, and you can't uh, use the right hand with istinja, rather you should be using the left hand. What do you do in this case? What you do is you take the, the stone, and you put it in your right hand. And then you take your left hand, and pick up the penis with your left hand, and wipe using the left hand onto the hajar, onto the stone. So you essentially, the one doing the action is the left hand. It's the left hand taking the organ to the stone and wiping it upon the stone. So the stone remains firm, right? And it, it remains stationary with the right hand. And you take, using the left hand, the sexual organ, and you wipe on the stone with the left hand. So the right hand is not actually doing any work. The one doing the work is the left hand. Right, the right hand is just a, it's just a supporter to the stone. So in that case, you can come with what? Al-Isijmar will be al So that's how you can reconcile between the two 
uh, points here of the fact that you can't use the right hand to touch the penis and you can't use the right hand to uh, to do a mar. So how do you do it? You take the stone, put it on the right hand, hold it firm, take the left hand, put the penis in the left hand, take that left hand, put it on your penis and then wipe the, uh, the, uh, the penis onto the stone with the left hand. So that's what's intended by what you send no BSRE here. Oh, you said no listing. Yeah, well, BSRE.